coming up on this edition of Real to Real. I'm Steve Kiltonic in Indian Orchard, where Immaculate Conception Parish recently celebrated its 120th anniversary of the church building. I'm Nick Morganelli. Church members grow fresh produce for the local food banks. And the Diocese of Springfield is heeding Pope Francis's call to care for God's creation. It's all just ahead on Real to Real. Hello and welcome once again to Real to Real. Well, our late summer weather has been so fabulous, helping us to better appreciate God's creation everywhere. This month marks the annual ecumenical celebration of the season of creation. And this year, Pope Francis has given us a wake up call to all Catholics to do more in caring for the planet. The Pope's message comes as Springfield Bishop William Byrne announced the recent formation of the Care of Creation Committee to implement the Pope's 2015 encyclical letter, Laudato Si. As honeybees buzz around Father Jack Schaefer's apiary at St. Thomas the Apostle Parish in West Springfield, the priest beekeeper lights his smoker and is ready to inspect his three hives doing his part to care for creation, which he says goes back to the book of Genesis. God made creation and then he gave humanity dominion over it. And that doesn't mean that we, you know, we control everything and we do whatever we want with it. Uh, with any kind of um, power comes responsibility. And so we have a responsibility to care for creation and to help it out when it needs help and to get out of the way when it doesn't. The earth is sick and it needs the prayers of Catholics as well as their personal commitment to care for creation. Pope Francis said this in his September 1st Angelus. The Pope's message coming as Springfield Bishop William Byrne recently announced the formation of the Care of Creation Committee. The future of the planet's at stake. Sobering words from Deacon Bill Toller from Mary Mother of Hope Parish in Springfield. The deacon, a member of the committee that is an outgrowth of a marinal group, meeting at the parish for the last eight years. They've been praying and looking for ways to create awareness. Simple, easy things to do, like changing the packaging on the sandwiches the parish makes each week. As you see here, we have signs for the sandwich ministry that we run every week. and. We were for years doing plastic bags, you know, and uh, plastic bags for the sandwiches, plastic bags to put the entire lunch in, and we've gotten away from that. From solar panels to recycling of plastics, paper, and cans, the committee hopes adults and children alike will be able to learn small and large ways they can contribute to the betterment of the planet. In Lee at St. Mary's Parish, there's a cistern collecting rainwater off the parish rectory. There are pollinator pathways along the streets and a composting bin at St. Mary's Elementary School. And Father Brian McGrath has been raising chickens for years. He and his parishioners can present many simple and effective ways to care for creation. The parish also runs a large ecumenical community garden. Members of the community, not just us Catholics, but different members from all different faiths have banded together to create a space that's educational and sustainable. It's a wonderful way to reach out to uh, some with food insecurity, foods brought to the local uh, senior citizens and different residences. Both Father Schaefer with his honeybees and Father McGrath with his chickens say that as we approach the Feast of St. Francis, October 4th, the patron saint of animals, birds, and the environment, the order of creation points to the reality of God. You have these small little creatures that just live a few weeks, and each one of them from the time they hatch to the time they die has specific roles and they fulfill them, you know, from guard bees to funeral bees. I've discovered where the funeral bees are leaving the bodies here on the parish grounds. And to me, that doesn't just happen. There has to be something behind that. We know what's behind that, and that's the creative power of God. And for folks looking to deepen their spirituality while praying for the planet, St. Francis's Canticle of Creation can be a start. So to, to take this love that God gave us of creation 
and let it be part of our spirituality. You know, look into Francis, what he's done and other saints. But I think on a personal level, time in your garden, time with your flower beds, time, you know, that you can go to your favorite pets or I have, I have my chickens, it can be a real way of growing your own spirituality. And soon the Care for Creation Committee hopes to have manuals available for all parishes, schools and others to use to get more involved in this important effort. In other events, Immaculate Conception Church in the Indian Orchard section of Springfield has been a spiritual haven for parishioners of Polish descent for 120 years now. Well, last Sunday, the parish held a special anniversary mass to remember their roots, celebrate their heritage, and continued the traditions passed down from their founders who came to the United States with little except their strong faith. Steve Kiltonic was there and has their amazing story of faith. On September 8th, parishioners of Immaculate Conception Parish in Indian Orchard gathered at the 10 a.m. Polish Mass to commemorate the 120th anniversary of the church building. The Auxiliary Bishop of Krakow, Poland, Robert Schornst, consolidated the Mass with Springfield Bishop William Byrne, Father Piotr Salik, the pastor, and Father Stanley Sokol, a former administrator. Children in traditional Polish costumes presented Bishop Schornst with a loaf of bread symbolic of thanksgiving for a good harvest and salt, which represents a healthy life. In his homily, he spoke of the church history and the importance of people growing in their faith. The history of Immaculate Conception goes back to 1880, when John Jerzyk became the first Polish settler in Indian Orchard. Twenty years later, 100 Polish families settled in the Tri-Town area of Indian Orchard, Ludlow, and Wilbraham. They worshipped at neighboring churches, with many walking to St. Stanislaus in Chicopee. In 1902, a small group of Polish men established St. Michael's Society, which petitioned Springfield Bishop Thomas Bevan to build a church closer to where they lived. Polish immigrants were looking mainly for jobs, and when they arrived had few, if any, possessions. They brought with them very open hearts to work hard and to provide to the needs of the people here. They brought their heritage and most of all their faith. And that's why believing in God was very important to them because in good and bad times, that's what usually Polish people do. They reach out and turn to God. The majority of Poles were employed at Ludlow Manufacturing located just across the Chicopee River. In 1903, the company donated swamp land on the corner of Parker and Main Streets to build their first church. Father Stanislaus Saluzniak was appointed as the first administrator of the parish. He organized a fundraising campaign and each family donated $25 towards the church construction. September 5, 1904 was a proud day for the Polish community as over 100 parishioners witnessed Bishop Bevan install this cornerstone in their brand new church building. Less than a month later, the first Mass was celebrated in the basement of the church. The church was named Immaculate Conception and dedicated to the Blessed Virgin Mary. Over the next century, the parish grew and parishioners were overjoyed that all the sacraments, including baptism, Holy Communion, confirmation, and marriage could be performed at their very own Polish church. Many priests, administrators, and deacons would serve the parish over the years. Significant parish milestones include the building of a parish school in 1909, the construction of the rectory and convent, the dedication of the war memorial in 1955, which honors Polish men who made the supreme sacrifice, and celebrations of the Golden Jubilee in 1954 and the 75th anniversary in 1980, the same year the Zinki Church Festival began. There have also been many exterior and interior renovations, the most notable being the five-year restoration, which ended in 2002, just in time for the centennial celebration in 2004. But like other parishioners here, Lorraine Mastri and his family goes back to the church's founding. My grandparents helped build this church. My mother was baptized here. Our whole family lived here for years. And I was baptized here, married here. She's one of the thousands of alumni who attended the K-8 school during its 94-year history. We had 11 or 12 sisters, Felician sisters that taught here. We learned English in the morning and Polish in the afternoon. 
Lorraine has fond memories of the sisters who instilled faith and values. They were very kind. They respected all of our, you know, they taught us love of God, love of country, respect for our family, respect for our elders. And they, they laid the basis of foundation for us from kindergarten. Church societies and sodalities have always been an important part of the parish culture. There's the Children of Mary, Sacred Heart Society, Young Ladies and Boys Rosary Sodality, Church Choir, Drama Club, and the Immaculate Conception Seniors, to name a few. The Polish School, which began in 1980, still flourishes on Saturday. Children are taught basic Polish language skills and learn Polish history and customs. Stacia and Nicholas collaborated to create the beautiful Dzinki wreath, which was carried during the opening procession. The Dzinki wreath represents Thanksgiving. It is brought to the churches to be blessed by the priests. Thanksgiving of the, um, the harvest, the plentiful harvest, but it's also for all the blessings we get throughout the year. I was um, put in charge of making like the original uh, concept sketch or drawing and then it was printed out to be larger, set over the uh, working surface. Wojcik added different kinds of grains to construct the intricate wreath. She chose to replicate the tabernacle for the main wreath design. When you walk into this church, that's the first thing you kind of focus in on. And realistically, that's what you should be focusing on. Bishop Byrne and Bishop Shornst were presented gifts at the end of Mass by children from the Polish school. And Bishop Byrne presented his Polish counterpart with a diocesan t-shirt to remember his visit, plus a baseball cap with the American flag. Father Salik hopes to continue the traditions of the many Polish priests who have served over the past 120 years. He wants to bring back many of the old customs and even start some of his own. I brought the relic of Sister Faustina in April and my future vision is that we're going to spend a little bit more time on being devoted to this beautiful devotion which is the chaplet to Divine Mercy. May Almighty God bless you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. After the blessing, parishioners sang a final Zhenkuya to Bishop Byrne. For Real to Real, I'm Steve Kiltonic. Steve said parishioners of Immaculate Conception still recall with pride and joy when Pope John Paul II became the first Polish Pope in 1978 and when Bishop Mitchell Rosansky was appointed the first Polish-American Bishop of Springfield in 2014. Both historic milestones that the Polish community, not only in Springfield but across the diocese, will always cherish. And next Sunday, September 22nd, the Chalice of Salvation televised Mass will be coming to you from the Immaculate Conception Church in Indian Orchard. So mark your calendars for that. And we will have much more ahead on Real to Real. Dan Dumas has the latest news from Western Massachusetts. And some ware parishioners till the earth in an effort to stem food insecurity in their area. It's all still to come on this edition of Real to Real. The Chalice of Salvation, your weekly spiritual connection. Take time out of your busy day and join us later on this morning at 10. We kick off the school year with Bishop William Byrne and students from our diocesan Catholic schools as we celebrate the 24th Sunday in Ordinary Time. The Chalice of Salvation, Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. right here on 22 News, WWLP, and at iobserve.org. Our family is made up of every race. We are young and old, rich and poor, men and women, sinners and saints. Our family has spanned the centuries and the globe. With God's grace, we started hospitals to care for the sick. We establish orphanages and help the poor. We are the largest charitable organization on the planet, bringing relief and comfort to those in need. We educate more children than any other scholarly or religious institution. We developed the scientific method and laws of evidence. We founded the college system. We defend the dignity of all human life and uphold marriage and family. 
Cities were named after our revered saints who navigated a sacred path before us. Guided by the Holy Spirit, we compiled the Bible. We are transformed by sacred scripture and sacred tradition, which have consistently guided us for 2,000 years. We are the Catholic Church. With over one billion in our family, sharing in the sacraments and fullness of the Christian faith, for centuries we have prayed for you and our world, every hour of every day, whenever we celebrate the Mass. Jesus himself laid the foundation for our faith when he said to Peter, the first pope, you are rock, and upon this rock I will build my church. For over 2,000 years, we've had an unbroken line of shepherds, guiding the Catholic Church with love and truth in a confused and hurting world. And in this world filled with chaos, hardship, and pain, it's comforting to know that some things remain consistent, true, and strong, our Catholic faith, and the eternal love that God has for all creation. If you've been away from the Catholic Church, we invite you to take another look. Visit catholicscomehome.org today. Ours is one family, united in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. We are Catholic. Welcome home. I'm Dan Dumas with your Real to Real News Briefs. Pope Francis is back at the Vatican after a demanding 12-day papal trip to Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, Timor-Leste, and Singapore, covering some 20,000 miles and journeying through Southeast Asia and Oceania. This was the longest trip in his pontificate. His first stop was Jakarta, Indonesia, a nation with the largest Muslim population of any country in the world. It also is home to Catholics and other Christians, Buddhists and Hindus. Meeting with the country's leadership, the Pope urged national unity as the work of craftsmanship entrusted to everyone, but in a special way to those in political life who should strive toward harmony, equity, respect for the fundamental rights of human beings, sustainable development, solidarity, and the pursuit of peace, both within society and with other peoples and nations. The Holy Father then traveled to Jakarta's Cathedral of Our Lady of the Assumption, where his message remained one of unity. He told those gathering that proclaiming the gospel does not mean imposing our faith or placing it in opposition to that of others, but giving and sharing the joy of encountering Christ always with great respect and fraternal affection for everyone. From Indonesia, the Pope then headed to the second stop of this papal trip, Papua New Guinea, a predominantly Christian country. Here, the Pope traveled outside the capital to visit with missionaries. The trip to the outpost, some 600 miles away, gave Pope Francis an opportunity to pay tribute to the generations of foreign missionaries who have and continue to share the gospel with the people of Papua New Guinea through their preaching and religious education, but also through their schools, orphanages, hospitals, and work for justice and the safeguarding of creation. Stop three of the papal trip brought the Holy Father to the Catholic nation of Timor-Leste, a country with a very young population, the average age just over 20 years old. The Pope told about 1,000 young people inside the convention center and another 2,000 listening outside, you are the clear majority of the population of this land and your presence fills it with life, hope, and a future. It is now up to the young to continue to work, guided by the gospel, to build a society where justice, cooperation, honesty, and unity reign. And from there, the Holy Father traveled to his final stop, Singapore, making the biggest transition of his 12-day trip to Asia and the Pacific, moving from one of the world's poorest countries to one of its wealthiest, and from one of the most youthful to one of the oldest. And no sooner was the Pope concluding this demanding trip, the Vatican announced the Holy Father will be traveling to Turkey in 2025. 
Closer to home, catechists from across our diocese gathered recently to receive special honors from Bishop Byrne. Carly McGrath tells us more. Catechists from across the Diocese of Springfield gathered at St. Michael's Cathedral for a special Chalice of Salvation Mass where they were recognized for their commitment to passing on the faith. 20 catechists received the St. Pope Pius X Award. Bishop Byrne was the principal celebrant. Jesus says before he ascends into heaven, go out and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son. And this day we honor and celebrate those who have done just that. Five catechists received catechetical leadership certificates and seven completed level one training for the Catechesis of the Good Shepherd program. This is all from the heart. They have answered their baptismal call to share the faith, pass it on, and without them, our faith would disappear. We need people to continue to educate those around us. We need to evangelize. Fernando Rodriguez teaches confirmation prep at Our Lady of the Sacred Heart Parish in Springfield. Both he and his teenage son are great witnesses of the faith. Rodriguez chaperoned youth from Olsh at the Steubenville East Conference in Springfield held last July. I think it's just important with all these battles that these kids and the youth face today that it's important for them to know that, hey, there is a community here, there is a Catholic church here, there is a God that loves you and that he's waiting for you. St. Pope Pius X was elected Pope in 1903 and wrote an encyclical in which he explained the important role of catechists. In Springfield, I'm Carolee McGrath. And congratulations to all. And in one week from today, next Sunday, September 22nd, the singing priests of the Diocese of Springfield will perform at St. Elizabeth Ann Seton Parish in Northampton. The concert begins at 2 p.m. in the main church, 99 King Street. There are a limited amount of tickets left. Tickets are $20, and to get yours, call 413-527-2636. You can read more on these and other stories at iobserve.org, where you can find articles from our Catholic communication staff, as well as on-demand episodes of Real to Real. That's iobserve.org. I'm Dan Dumas, and those were your Real to Real news briefs. Finally today, with grocery prices remaining high, that means for those in our communities with a tight budget, having a local food pantry as well as a take and eat program is an essential blessing. Nick Morganelli recently traveled to Ware, where he discovered a team of parishioners who have expanded their food pantry ministry by planting a vegetable garden to help tackle food insecurity in their community. We realized there's something we were missing. And, uh, you know, after figuring it out, we went to a church here, a church there, and realized Catholicism was the, was the way to go. Nearly two years ago, Patrick and Kathy Gallery, drawn to the Catholic faith, found their spiritual home at St. Mary's in Ware. Jesus said, see me poor, give to me, you see me hungry, you fed me. So, that's what I try to do. Patrick and his wife dedicated time to the food ministry which serves dozens on the second and fourth Saturday morning of each month with groceries and a hot meal to go. The Western Mass Food Bank and parishioners from both St. Mary's and All Saints Church provide food to the pantry. One volunteer, hearing of Patrick and Kathy's love for gardening, had an idea. One of the ladies who's involved, she suggested to my wife that we maybe start a garden. We've always had a garden. It's a lot of work to start. Once you start it, it's just kind of go, you put her here, you put her there. I was just happy that there was something to get involved in. And start it they did, across the street from St. Mary's Church behind the rectory. In doing so, they expanded the food pantry with more fresh grown produce. Volunteers Rick Allard and his wife Merle now help in the garden too. We come down on a Friday and help stock the shelves and we come down on Saturday morning and help out with the frozen foods and signing people in. And Patrick and his wife have got a beautiful garden over there at St. Mary's. One morning we were weeding the squash plants and all that, but they do a great job over there. They have beans, they have squash, tomatoes, he has potatoes, zucchini. 
Patrick and Kathy's love for gardening brought a harvest for this community to enjoy. The last two meals we did, we incorporated the squash into the meal, and then my wife made zucchini bread that we froze that we gave out today. And I put it out on the, on the table, and next time I came out, it was gone, so that's amazing. It is a blessing because, like I did the other day, I went to buy my little one some steaks because he's really starting to eat, trying to eat meat. Three steaks I bought for 40 bucks after cooking them, they were the size of my chihuahua's little head. So coming here helps us get in the fresh veggies, getting in some meat to help out to get by until either your welfare checks kick in or you get paid. Deborah's friend, Kevin Smith, believes this ministry's impact goes beyond just the physical food. It is a blessing, all these food banks. Um, some people take them for granted, like everybody in town has them, and that's not the case. So when you get companies or organizations that are willing to put together some stuff and for the public, that is, it just, you know, gives hope. And sometimes that hope is shared through artwork. Judith, who comes here every week, she wanted to thank us for our help, and she made us these beautiful posters. But people will make donations. They, they feel better, even if it's a couple dollars or whatever. And then we put it toward the meals, the hot meals that we give out, you know. But, um, but they think, no matter what, they want to thank us. The appreciation from the pantry patrons, it, it just makes you, feel, makes you feel good. Thank you very much. And you can help by donating to a food pantry in your community. Harvesting produce and planting seeds of hope in where for Real to Real, I'm Nick Morganelli. And Nick tells us that the folks in Ware say now is the time to start planning to form a garden team for your church before the spring seeds are sown. What a great example of care for creation and helping the less fortunate. And for this week, that's Real to Real. We thank you so much for joining us today. Be sure to keep up to date on all of the latest news on the Catholic Church, both here in Western Massachusetts and around the world, on our news and information website, iobserve.org. There you will find articles prepared by our Catholic Communications reporting team and our partners at Our Sunday Visitor, news you will not find in your local newspaper. There's only one place to get church news, and that's iobserve.org. And we're also on Facebook, so you can follow us there at Catholic Communications. Join me next week as Real to Real pays its annual visit to the New England Great State Fair, the Big E. And if you are heading out to the Big E today, don't forget you can also fulfill your Sunday Mass obligation by attending Bishop William Burns' 10 a.m. Mass this morning under the Big Top. And there will be Masses on each of the Sundays during the fair, 8 a.m. in the Storyton Village Meeting House, and again at 10 a.m. under the Big Top. So make attending Mass part of your Big E experience. And I will see you at this same time next week from the Big E for a special edition of Real to Real, your window on the world around you. See you then. Real to Real is a production of the Catholic Communications Corporation funded in part by the annual Catholic Appeal, and the support of you, our faithful viewers.